Good morning, uh, and thank you for joining us at the U.S. Institute of Peace for a discussion on India's foreign policy toward its crisis-stricken neighborhood. My name is Dan Markey, uh, and I'm a senior advisor here at USIP in the South Asia program. And today I'm joined by Dr. Avinash Paliwal. Um, Dr. Paliwal is a reader in international relations at SOAS, University of London. Prior to this position, he was a deputy director of the SOAS uh, South Asia Institute. He taught defense studies at King's College London and was the Defense Academy postdoctoral fellow uh, also at King's. He specializes in the international relations of South Asia. His first book, My Enemy's Enemy, India in Afghanistan from the Soviet Invasion to the U.S. Withdrawal, was published by Hearst and Oxford University Press in 2017. It details India's role in Afghanistan during and after the Cold War. His forthcoming book, India's Near East, A New History, which will be published by Hearst in 2024, unpacks India's faltering attempts to exert control over its eastern hinterland and the neighboring states of Bangladesh and Myanmar. Avinash holds an MA and PhD in International Relations from King's College London and a BA in Economics from the University of Delhi. Formerly a visiting fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi, he briefly worked as a foreign affairs journalist before entering academia. Avinash, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, now, over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to ask Avinash a few questions. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to open the floor to participation from the room as well as online. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, uh, please use the chat box on usip.org to ask your questions. Um, before asking your questions, if you're in the room, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and affiliation, we'll make sure uh, to use those before we dive right in. Now, by way of context for this conversation, I think everyone here is following South Asia closely enough to appreciate uh, that India's neighbors, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, are themselves undergoing turmoil that has pretty direct consequences for India. So if we look to the West, in Pakistan, you would say over the past year plus, Pakistan has been in a state of polycrisis, characterized by political turmoil, economic challenges, surging violence, and so on. In Bangladesh, to the east, the dispute over upcoming elections has cast a real shadow over nearly every aspect of political life. Uh, and over the past month or so, um, street protests have gotten a great deal more violent. And in Myanmar, uh, the 2021 military coup uh, complicated India's domestic policy in the bordering states of the Northeast, as well as India's regional and global policies, as New Delhi has struggled to navigate an effective approach for dealing with the Myanmar military. And in all three of India's nearby neighbors, China has actively extended its influence in recent years. And of course, since uh, 2020, We've seen serious India-China border tensions along the line of actual control. So with all of that in mind, uh, Avinash, uh, your research has focused on what I would describe as a deep interconnectedness between India and its nearby neighborhood. Um, India's relations with the uh, countries that I've mentioned are not just conducted between capitals, but between communities and political economies. Uh, that are uh, currently and historically have been tied together. And I think this is definitely true in Pakistan. We think about that somewhat, but also very much true in Bangladesh and Myanmar, although obviously the specifics are different. So what I'd like to do is begin with a general question that gets to some of your deep historical expertise on the region before we pull back and do something of a tour of these various uh, challenges facing India. So my question is, what would you say is the single most important way in which India's neighborhood relations are affected by these deeper historical attachments? Or to put it a little bit differently, what does New Delhi do differently as it manages these neighborhood relationships as compared to how it conducts itself with other countries in the world, say uh, the United States or Japan uh, or Russia? Dan, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for having me here. It's an honor to be here at USIP. And thank you for that excellent question, right? I mean, 
there is something that I have always uh, felt that India's neighborhood policy in particular is in some shape or form an extension of its domestic politics. Now, of course, uh, the argument that domestic politics and foreign policy is invariably tied is a very obvious argument to make. In the neighborhood, you see it get much more pronounced. And I think the core driver, and I think this is a continuing driver post-independence still, in a different ideological gap, but till today, is this desire in New Delhi to make sure that the republics or the states that exist in your neighborhood, uh, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Bangladesh, Myanmar, other countries, they are actually, they, they survive, they, you know, they're stable. And that anxiety, that anxiety about the stability of these countries goes back to the moment of partition, mm -hmm. which is still in some shape and form actually playing out and animating both the anxieties and aspirations of India's political class, right? So this idea that we are looking at a neighborhood which is actually politically and socially quite torn, uh, there are large minorities, sizable religious and ethnic minorities, linguistic minorities uh, in each country, both India and its neighborhood. Uh, those are really difficult political questions to, to kind of come to grips with, to tackle on an ongoing basis, which have no silver bullet. So when you are dealing with all those kind of fractious issues and trying to figure out an effective workable state in an international system. You want your neighbor's neighborhood to be stable just like yourself because that is important for your own stability. So this desire of stability has, I feel, always animated it because instability, instability would lead to movement of people across borders. Now, what we see as lines on maps and assume that these are international states completely, uh, you know, working independently with their independent independent kind of interests and ideas are actually often very intertwined. If there is a meltdown, a political or an economic meltdown, for example, in Bangladesh, it will directly impact India's own domestic politics. So that desire uh, in terms of movement of people, in terms of you know, uh, political unrest, political violence, uh, we have seen that Assam's politics, domestic, I mean, the, the politics of the state of Assam has direct correlation to what happens in Bangladesh in some which way or form. So that desire has been a continuing desire. And that does mean that the idea or the rhetoric of democracy uh, or liberal or participatory politics as understood, especially in Washington DC or United States, but also in Europe, uh, has a very different color and caliber when you think about it from an Indian perspective in its neighborhood. Yes, that is desirable. No, that is not very pressing. Stability is, even if it not, it's not at the, you know. Uh, the second issue which I would say is very important and it, it resonates with this desire of these neighboring states remaining stable is that once they are stable, what do they do with relation to you, right? There has always been a security concern and it again goes back to the deep anxieties uh, that we saw kind of emerge between India and Pakistan before 71 united Pakistan. But also looking at countries in your east from a particular kind of religious or ethnic prism or the prism of, you know, uh, conflict, uh, conflict dynamics, cr dynamics cross-border conflict dynamics. So if you have anyone in power in your neighborhood who has an antithetical or uh, an ideological outlook which militates against who is in power in New Delhi, that is a very sound recipe for having a conflict at hand, right? So, so security dynamics then become very much salient in India's calculation in its approach towards its neighbors. So it does prefer political leaders in power who are at least respectful of your national security interests. And I think that's another continuing theme. How you explain that, whether you explain that in liberal kind of secular categories or whether you explain that in Hindu nationalist categories is a separate point. But that is something which I would say the political elite in Delhi is quite united. And that brings me to the last point of your, of your question of how is this different from how India does politics or geopolitics or does foreign policy with great powers. Now look, this invariably gives a color of, you know, uh, this neighborhood is something that India feels that it has natural dominance in. It has much more, uh, it should have much more say in how the politics plays out. The, I, the, the, the core principles that guide, let's say, Indo-US uh, interaction in categories of you know, shared values of democracy 
uh, shared values of rules-based order. I think even though important and desired in the neighborhood, that is not the first port of call on how India would make its policy, let's say towards Bangladesh or Myanmar. Right, so, so, so the, what, what is driving its operational practice in terms of whether it's talking to the junta in Nepito or supporting Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh or not talking to Pakistan uh, are those very basic, very powerful, very compelling drivers uh, where the dual need of stability and security is much more supreme than the idea of democracy and participatory politics, even if it is desired. Thank you. Uh, great answer and comprehensive and sweeping, as I imagine your, your next book will be. Uh, and I, I do want to just linger on this uh, because I think you have some important uh, points to make here, not just with respect, because you've answered well how India's um, management of its relations with its neighbors may be different uh, than it is with, with other global players, but flip it around a bit, if you would, yeah. and think um, about how these relationships may have changed India. Because I know you've given this some thought as well, um, particularly in its, in its early and founding days, yes. uh, how that's affected India's own development. Because uh, as all of us know, these, are parts, these were parts, in a sense, of India or of British India. Yeah. And so that interconnection also has a consequence for India itself. Yes. Thanks. That's a great question. And look, in terms of, and I'll, I'll go back in time, I'll go back to the moment of partition and that's such a seismic event now everyone who's interested in south asia looks at the subcontinent knows the partition is important but i think and it's been studied quite intensely especially in context of the india pakistan standoff over kashmir or boundary disputes in the west but perhaps relatively less so in the east and one thing which i'm increasingly realizing and that's partly going to be the main pitch of the book as well that india's diplomacy regional diplomacy and it's nation building are actually deeply intertwined. Mm. Who is in power in Dhaka, in Rangoon or Nepito, in Karachi or Islamabad? Uh, how do they approach questions of protecting minorities within their own countries? In this case, it would be Hindu minorities in, let's say, Pakistan or Bangladesh after 71. It would be Indians or of different, you know, diff cross religion in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan Tamil question, right? Uh, how do these states deal with questions of minority protection and rights has a very direct consequence on how you do politics domestically as well. It actually features, it because these are neighboring states, in your electoral calculus. Assam is a very classic case in point, but not the only one, where movement of people has a very direct consequence of how electoral roles look which party benefits from that electoral role, right? These are very animated debates. I do think that, uh, you know, this larger shifting of Indian politics from a center-left gravity, uh, especially during the 70s and 80s, to this larger lurch towards the right over the last two odd decades, mm -hmm. perhaps after 1992, but definitely post-2014, has as much a link to how India's neighborhood itself changed as much as India did, right? There is a reason why, for example, uh, the revocation of Article 370 uh, from Jammu Kashmir in 2019, as it was done, is so ideologically central to how the, the Jansang or the Bharatiya Janata Party views not just India, but the region itself. It is restructuring the terms of relationship uh, with India's neighbor as much as people uh, or, or the citizens of India, right? Uh, in the East, we saw the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, the introduction, the recrafting of the National, National Register for Citizens. None of these issues that we see play out today with such degree of ferocity, with such degree of commitment from the government of India are actually new. The National Register of Citizens was created in 1950. That has animated the politics of Assam uh, since then, the Jansang was created in 1950-51 because of the expulsion, of systematic expulsion of Bengali Hindus from East Pakistan uh, in 1949, but continuing, continuingly so even afterwards, right? So this is, these, these developments have had quite a powerful impact on how India has come to see itself. And I'll give you just two short examples. There is a very potent sort of narrative that India was a soft state for a considerable period of time, till of course now it has become a very powerful, strong state, a muscular state. And when you actually look at the history, you realize that it is actually a pretty hard state from birth. Mm -hmm. 
because it has no other option in its own worldview but to have a very robust kind of security centric policy uh, because you're dealing in your perspective with people who you want to accept your nation pro nationalist project but are resisting whether it's the nagas or later the mizos in kashmir eventually uh, even in south there were language movements right which became very violent in tamil nadu and elsewhere uh, but if you extend that logic of diversity and social conflict beyond the boundaries post partition that we see then you start realizing that look we are actually looking at a very diverse uh, very polarized situation across the subcontinent and this 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 domestic politics as we understand it in pakistan and bangladesh has a very powerful geopolitical link communal violence in 1960s west bengal had a direct resonance on the position of hindus in bangla in east pakistan and vice versa mm. in fact we saw tit for tat rioting happening uh, between the two bengals so to say uh, and suddenly you realize that communal violence takes a geopolitical aspect right so 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 those are strains which we see flesh out in different shapes and forms today fascinating uh thank you and i think we're going to come back to some of these themes but i want to pivot a little bit uh now to contemporary uh situation and i want to start uh in a, in a sense in the west with pakistan um of india's regional relationships of course um pakistan is the one that at least here in washington has received the most attention over the years um we know we all know about their deep and continuing uh, historical differences, the fact that both have nuclear weapons, the yep. fact that both have gone to war multiple times keeps this storyline fresh in our minds. So I'd like to just, uh, in simple terms, get your sense of the, the state of play today. Um, you know, you can take this any way that you like, but one angle here would be that both sides are coming to uh, elections yes. in, this, in this next year. So, so politics, in a sense, is bringing them to not the same place, but a, a convergence of yeah. sorts. Um, and there are ways in which we've seen um, politics create trouble in their relationship in the past, certainly in the lead up to elections in 2019. That was very much a part of the Indian uh, story. But at the same time, perhaps this opens a, a window for a reset. Uh, in the relationship as, as leaders come back with a fresh mandate or come in uh, with a new chapter. So how do you think of, of this? I do think that once the electoral cycles are over, now in India there is a, you know, it's, it's a largely stable kind of predictable uh, process in that sense and there is I mean of course no one can predict elections in South Asia uh, so I don't want to say that this is going to be 100% the case but there is a very strong chance of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi getting a third term, term. that is almost an assumption that the bureaucracy is working with uh, it would be a renewed mandate what that means is yet to be seen uh, at least in a domestic sense but if that coincides with the rise or the uh, assumption of power uh, in Pakistan by a civilian face uh, which New Delhi believes is someone they can work with, someone they can engage with without the baggage of expectation that this would lead to a resolution of some of the longest standing issues, Kashmir and other things. Uh, at least, and that, that individual would most likely be Nawaz Sharif. Yeah. Um, with support, I'm assuming, with the military establishment, General Munir. Uh, there is like there's likely to be a window of opening sometime in the middle or later half of 2024 that is something both sides want to happen uh, they might not put it out in official policy that is something that has geopolitical logic given india's very kind of heightened security situation uh, on the northern border with china it it does suit indian policymakers to have a ceasefire as we can see at the line of control but perhaps take it one step further to if not resolve issues to kind of you know maybe talk about resumption of trade even if it's smaller items there's a case to be made on that count and that logic dictates equally powerfully for the Pakistani security establishment who is facing one of the most press kind of you know pressing security threats on its western side from Afghanistan the Tehreek Taliban Pakistan insurgency the resurgence or you know third time third avatar of the Baloch insurgency in some shape and form uh, has actually I mean that situation has worsened since the arrival of the Afghan Taliban in 2021 so there is a need there is likely to be a moment 
And that is exactly when I would put on my historian's hat and say, caution. <laughs> and there is two reasons for that, right? Uh, look, the, the structural realities of the domestic situations of these two countries is just not conducive enough for a serious dialogue to last. In the case of Pakistan, that, was not, that will not be a deficit of intent. That will be just the reality of a poly crisis, wherein your economy is continually so in, going in a tailspin. Uh, the political situation is such that the military wants to be in power, but absolutely have no responsibility. That uh, you just keep on rotating the wheel of the civilian uh, face because someone else needs to take responsibility of the economy, even though the military is just as important an economic player as much as it is an, a political and an armed player in that country. So I think Pakistan might just fail to deliver, even if we keep the questions about how it is dealing with its frustration for not being able to actually do anything by India's strategic decision to abrogate Article 370 in 2019. There is considerable frustration within the Pakistani army of we, you know, that that they have not been able to kind of push back. Um, on the Indian side, I do believe there is a lot more agency that the leadership enjoys. I do not think that uh, the BJP will be really hamstrung by political opinion to not be able to exploit that opportunity. In fact, they can really sell that to the domestic audience and find acceptability as as a big kind of hearted move during a new mandate and India is trying to be the, the bigger player, the more generous partner, uh, or not partner, but a generous neighbor in that sense. Uh, and if Pakistan fails to deliver, then you can always go back and say that, look, this is something that we have done before uh, and we, you know, and they didn't deliver. Having said that, let's assume for a second that Pakistan delivers and India builds on that conversation. Then how far you take that given how anti-Pakistan the political sentiment is. So even if you can you know, sell that rapprochement for a period of, let's say, six months, one year, can that last? Can that kind of, because then you'll come to questions that were being asked between 2004 and seven by the respective leaderships, when they were in part of this composite dialogue, people to people connection. And that fundamentally, as of today, militates against the domestic politics of both India and Pakistan. So that is where I would suggest caution, but I do hope that you know there, it's actually the two countries badly need to talk to each other uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, and it is actually in their interests to, uh, to build some sort of an understanding, go back to the drawing table and say that, look, uh, this animosity has not helped any of the two players in mm -hmm. any which way. Now, even with the caveats that you've just introduced, uh, seeing an India-Pakistan um, conversation, uh, return to some kind of a composite dialogue, something like that, would be, I agree, a positive step. Yeah. Um, but you've introduced the China angle here, yeah. um, and in a way, as a, as a positive uh, factor. That is, India's concerns about China actually lead it to be more open yeah. uh, to uh, opening a conversation with Pakistan. Um, but I wonder how that plays out, uh, both in Indian minds and expectations, this uh, two-front threat, Yes. How, uh, how India perceives this and how, in your own view, whether India should perceive it in those terms and what then that would mean for the prospects of an India-Pakistan uh, rapprochement in, in the same lines that you've already explored. So first of all, China will always be present in this issue, right? Chi India will always think about the Chinese equation or the Chinese question when talking to Pakistan, even though there is a very powerful bilateral dynamic to this relationship, right? Let me answer your question of this idea of two-front threat going back more in time to, let's say, the 1960s or late 1950s, uh, when the, the two-front threat actually took shape, took birth, uh, and join it to the Galwan moment in 2020, when there was a brief moment of anxiety, anxiety in India that you could probably le see a two-front threat materialize in a kinetic sense. Look, when 1962 war with China really traumatizes India, but it's actually the 1965 war with Pakistan that actually concretizes or uh, awakens Indian security planners for a real operational uh, sort of synergy between the Pakistani armed forces and the PLA in China to jointly do something against India. And that leaves India very vulnerable in a military and a security sense, both in the north uh, but also in the east. Now, 
since then till now the fundamental of india's diplomacy especially in the neighborhood has not necessarily been to kind of create a wedge between pakistan and china even that if that would be a great thing to do but to make sure that the alignment that exists between these two countries does not get operationalized in a military sense during moments of crisis and i think that is likely to dominate the practice and that is shaping india's response towards the ceasefire that we see post 22 since 2021 that was very much in response to the fact that pakistan under general uh, kamar javed bajwa did not exploit indian vulnerability uh, when it was facing the chinese threat and a very different quality of chinese pressure in the north in galwan uh, that remains the case but having said that i think from the pakistani perspective uh, there is a different kind of reality when they're dealing with the chinese is that the bet that you put on china even though it's important even though there is alignment of interest you know to keep some to counterbalance india to a certain degree has actually not paid the dividends that islamabad expected it to pay china is not the kind of strategic savior in a financial or a military sense uh, that you actually wanted it to be that you expected it to be so islamabad faced disappointment with two of its main allies historically speaking both the united states and china so in that case what do you do in that case you actually need to recraft multi alignment not in an indian sense but in a pakistani sense and that's where i think the fact that uh, both general bajwa and general munir is very focused domestically right now uh, but may reach out to the united states not to kind of arbiter between the two countries but to lubricate that kind of a conversation that remains to be to be to be the case what beijing will do at that point in time yet is yet to be seen and that's that's for me an unknown but i do think that that shapes the environment very strongly so so uh so i take it that that your view is that uh, maybe india in a sense official india overestimates the degree of joined threat between pakistan and china in part because pakistan has actually gotten less in terms of strategic assistance from china than than they would like is mm-hmm. that is that a fair characterization or overestimation is not the term i would use mm-hmm. but i do think because 2020 there was a moment where it could have played out there was there, that was just a very realistic estimation that and we do know that there were pakistani army officers intelligence officer who were coordinating or liaisoning with the pla during that crisis of course uh, so i don't think overestimation but i do think there is a deep seated anxiety a historically grounded anxiety around that mm-hmm. and and that anxiety might look as a, a stretch the farther you go from the region but if you are a policy maker taking a decision from new delhi at that point in time uh, it would seem very real mm-hmm. uh, so i think india is I- india would never risk kind of underestimating it it would rather risk overestimation than underestimation in in this particular instance yeah, yeah. good thank you okay let's uh let's shift gears again uh now we're going to head to bangladesh um you know i had an opportunity uh just a little over a month ago to be uh in dhaka with a few of my uh usip colleagues and that was just before this latest uptick in um political protests and street protests but it's been clear for some time of course that bangladesh's uh, elections would be a huge test yeah. uh not just a political test but a test almost of state uh stability um uh and uh whether the nation would would hold together and uh as you've observed uh in a variety of publications um india has a lot invested yes. in its relations with bangladesh but not just in relations with dhaka officially mm-hmm. or bangladesh generally but with uh sheikh hasina in particular so i wonder how um if you could give us a better sense as to how uh, new delhi perceives this relationship and especially the the peculiar and special relationship it has with india with bangladesh's current leader thank you done one thing i think that undergirds india's perception about and that's been borne out in reality uh, as far as bangladesh is concerned is the fact that there is a feeling that bangladesh as a country has historically and that's because of what happened in east pakistan before 1971 how the war was fought the war of liberation what did what the war actually did to the different people who were fighting for bangladesh and bangladeshis fighting for that not indian policy or pakistani approach there was a lot of schism 
between different political parties, whether it was the Awami League, the jamaat e islami the Bangladesh jamaat e islami the, the left movements typified by Maulana Bhashani, that this particular body politic has struggled to deal with non-violent transitions of power, mm. historically. Right? It has struggled to basically figure out how do you transition power in a respectable manner. And I would not even take it as far as the question of democracy or participation. It's simply that you, know, you need to figure out how to deal with transitions. And you have struggled with that. How do you deal with the polity? And there are good reasons for that. This is not something I blame the Bangladeshi uh, leaders for, you know, for out of lack of imagination or parochialism. It's simply that this was a country which was born uh, really bereaved of some of the core resources that a state requires. Mm -hmm. right? It faced one of the most devastating famines in 1974, which actually does not get the kind of due respect that is required to understand the geopolitics of the region, but also the politics of Bangladesh, and why they are so anxious about poverty and so as aspirational about development, even as seen up today, right? Uh, I think there is a calculation in that context that, look, you are dealing with two big political parties led by two big families, which are, whether it's the Zia Rahman's family, Khalid Zia, or the Mujibur Rahman's family, uh, Sheikh Hasina, and the third party is, of course, the armed forces, which has always been a politicized entity in Bangladesh. Uh, and you have to basically play around these three power poles, and you take a decision that which of these three, or how can you shape the worldview and the realities of these three, so that they do not adopt policies which undermines three core asks that India has always had in relation to East Pakistan and Bangladesh since 1947-48. And the three asks is, one, protection of minorities, in this case, Hindus in Bangladesh or East Pakistan, um, not allowing that soil to be used by anti-India insurgent groups or militant groups, especially focused on the Northeast. You know, uh, India's state building project in the Naga areas was really violent, really limitedly successful, and even now they're struggling, as we can see in Manipur, not just with the Nagas, but even the Kuki Zomi communities. Um, and the third ask has always been to connect. When you partition a land, to connect it takes a very different political logic. So India wanting to connect infrastructurally, build that railway line which was destroyed in 1965, build that uh, road that would take us to Chittagong port, give us some birthing rights at Chittagong port, the transshipment port. That goes back to the anxieties and the realities created by partition. This was actually, I mean, some of the biggest economic impact of the partition of 1947 was actually felt in the East more than the West. Right? And this is something that Indian policymakers historically have struggled with. Uh, even the idea of Act East or Look East previously, it actually was birthed in 1968. So what Indian policymakers are today saying that we want better connectivity with Bangladesh or Myanmar, the idea was officiated within India's power corridors uh, during Indira Gandhi's time in 1968, and that has been a story of struggle and continuingly so. From that perspective, which of the people, which of the political players in Bangladesh can deliver that best for a continuing period? And that is where Indian calculation comes in. And that's the idea of security and stability kicks in that, look, it is Sheikh Hasina who can deliver. It's Sheikh Hasina who has delivered. So from an Indian vantage point, between 2009 and right this point in time when we talk, uh, Sheikh Hasina has delivered in terms of protecting Hindu minorities. Yes, there have been attacks against Hindus occasionally in 2021, the Durga Puja attack was a quite, quite, quite an anomaly in that sense. But it believes that fundamentally she has actually delivered on that count. The insurgents, uh, insurgencies or the kind of separatist elements today find much more space and succor in Myanmar or China even uh, than Bangladesh. So you have given on some of your two core security concerns and deliver to a certain extent on connectivity. And that allows India to say that, look, she has given us what we want. Uh, now she's facing trouble domestically for her own kind of policy crises that she imposed and the contradictions that you build by having kind of, you know, compromise elections successively. Uh, you broke your own social contract, that's your problem, but for us, you're a good bet. And that is where India's policy drive continues, that we will continue to invest in you. We do not know how others will react. We do not trust 
the BNP because they actually went completely the other way on these issues when they were in power between 2001 and 2006 or 1991 and 96, if not before. So this is what is actually driving. It's just this sense of anxiety that if the BNP comes to power uh, in free and fair elections, which they most likely will because there's mm -hmm. such deep and widespread anti-incumbency against Asina, uh, they might adopt policies which will directly hurt India's national interests and will most likely complicate the security and the electoral dynamics, both of West Bengal and of Assam, if there is a big movement of minorities out of Bangladesh. So that is what is really animating and it is completely at odds with how uh, people in Washington DC view Bangladesh and its yeah. politics. So you've given us a great uh, sense as to, to that uh, perspective and I'd like to just push this out a little bit into the future, into a, an imagined future. Yeah when India's interests in security and stability, and in particular, its desire to see Sheikh Hasina be the guarantor of those things may come into uh, be, be jeopardized very directly. How far do you think India might go uh, to protect those interests? Uh, what will India do um, if there is something that looks like a, almost a political meltdown in Bangladesh? In terms of saving the person of Sheikh Hasina, I think India would do what it takes. If it requires uh, emergency military kind of uh, capabilities to be mobilized, I do think that is something. India would not want Hasina to be harmed mm -hmm. in a physical direct sense. That's very clear. Uh, we have had historical instances when that th those moments did come into play. Uh, but if there is a serious meltdown, I think there is a feeling in India that let's assume for a second that the Awami League, due to mass unrest, due to a political economic crisis, economic meltdown I think might happen before, or it will segue into the political moment that we have seen. Uh, if there is that moment where Awami League is forced out of power for where, with, with whatever reason, right, uh, then who comes to stabilize? It goes back to this idea of stability. Who enters the, question, the, the fray in terms of stabilizing and the only force that there is who can do that, who can deliver, are the armed forces of Bangladesh. So if I were sitting in Delhi right now, I would be thinking plan B and plan C would be, okay, make sure that if that happens, if a 2007 moment comes back, when 2007-8 were two years of military caretaker government, that's not what you desire. You want the elections to go through, Sheikh Hasina to remain in power, the world com international community, the West and all to accept the status quo, reality, uh, even if there's some sanctions, okay, fine, they won't bite as much. Uh, but if that does not happen, then you want to have uh, an individual uh, from the armed forces of Bangladesh who respects your interest. So I would believe that India would put its trust more in those officials to come and play the, the, the caretaker's role, if not the landlord's. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, than the BNP at this point in time. Interesting. So there's a, just a quick follow-up on that. There's an interesting political alignment, or so it seems, between India and China in Bangladesh in terms of support for the existing regime yeah. uh, and an emphasis on stability. Is this, is this a right read? And then beyond that, does India, uh, what concerns does India have, even if it is on the same page with China on Sheikh Hasina, what concerns does it have, ought to have, with China's involvement there? Yeah. So again, a Im very important question. Look, on the face of it, there is uniformity of posture, where China is supporting Sheikh Hasina, India clearly supports Sheikh Hasina, uh, and that might make some believe that there is uniformity of interest or alignment of interest. And I would disagree with that interpretation. India and China are trying to outbit each other to influence Sheikh Hasina and the Awami League. There have been battles fought in terms of uh, which officials get promoted within the bureaucracy, within Awami League, who gets more privilege, which economic actors within Bangladesh get more privilege, who, who's, who are they tied to in terms of their economic interests, their economic networks. And that's a battle you know, we see having been fought on this landscape of connectivity, as they call it, mm -hmm. uh, wherein you know, China wanting to build a port uh, in I think Sonadia was there in 2014-15, then it was scrapped, and uh, now they want to pitch for Matarbari, uh, the Dhaka transportation corridor, the, 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 the metro that they have built has been using Chinese capital and Chinese sort of, you know, uh, even expertise. 
I think that might make people believe that okay, this is something that uh, you know maybe uh, India and Ch China will actually silently enter an understanding. I doubt that. I doubt that. This is one thing that uh, Indian policymakers, and this is where also divergences come in. If you talk to a security policymaker or who views B Bangladesh very strongly from a security prism, this is actually a cause of concern despite Hasina having delivered so much. And this for Hasina is very important to have that outreach to China to assert her autonomy vis-a-vis -vis India. You don't want to be in a very tight dependency with New Delhi either. There is a whole body of opinion which is critical of India on your country and you have to respect that political reality, that social reality. And how do you do that if you don't do it by uh, tilting towards Pakistan, which you don't want to? And there's no need to given the situation in Pakistan. That's going towards the Chinese. China is doing that not only to keep Indians on the toes, but also to keep the West on its toes in Bangladesh. Right? This is a this is a country in which uh, you want to kind of have some presence, keep the Indians kind of a bit anxious, and let the West kind of do its advocacy on democracy, but but have some degree of footing, have that kind of geopolitical anxiety kind of boiling to some degree. Uh, on balance, I think India is much more confident as far as China's presence in, is concerned in Bangladesh, given its own equities. Yes, security people are much are concerned about Chinese presence, but they are also very aware that beyond a point, Sheikh Hasina is someone who will not cross India's red lines, even on the China question. Fascinating. Okay, let's shift over now to Myanmar, um, where perhaps India is a little less comfortable uh, with the Chinese presence. Uh, clearly, um, at least from the outside, it looks like uh, your characterization of India's concerns being about stability and security are the principal drivers for how it has related uh, to um, Myanmar, certainly since uh, 2021, since yeah. the coup there, but perhaps a uh, much longer yeah. uh, span as well. But right now, as we're sitting here, it looks like the military is in trouble. Yes. Uh, and it looks like the ground situation in terms of um, uh, the shift in power within Myanmar uh, may uh, be more challenging even than it has been for India to navigate. So yeah. if you could play out a little bit how you expect uh, New Delhi is seeing these events yeah. and how it may uh, respond to them. Yeah. So, you know, Myanmar is at such uh, such a critical crossroads done uh, and I think it's at a crossroads out of its own fault with the coup that was initiated in February 2021 it did kind of trigger a very different caliber of resistance which I don't think we have seen in a long time you cannot compare the pushback that the junta received after 2021 to what it did after 1988 when the 8888 move, uh, movement kind of an Aung San Suu Kyi writ literally returned from Oxford to take charge of the democracy movement. 88 was a moment when there was internal turmoil within the junta, but we had seen a military uh, dictatorship since 1962 at least, if not 58, right? In 2021, we see a 10-year hiatus where even if illiberally so, there were pockets of freedom, political, economic, social, uh, at least for the majority communities that are living in, in, in Myanmar, the, the Burma, Burma Buddhist heartland, the lower, the lower Burma, Myanmar as we know it, uh, in Rangoon, Napito, Yangon, Napito. Uh, and that generation really saw promise and opening and, and a window uh, to be able to kind of engage with global processes and really kind of come out of the clutch of the junta. And that, that, that culling that very abruptly in 2021 has really increased a lot of, you know, Created, has created a lot of anxieties. What we are seeing today is absolutely unprecedented in, you know, uh, not unprecedented. The last time I would say uh, we saw that kind of intergroup ethnic cohesion to push back in a kinetic sense against the junta because it's a military kind of uh, you know entity that is ruling quite brutally. So was in 1949 at the moment when Myanmar Burma actually got independence. Right. That was the only time when there was a real serious threat to the state of post-colonial Burma. And you know what? Being so cautious about or uh, conscious about stability, it was the Indians who came to the support of the of then government of UNU, very militarized government, uh, and gave them offensive weaponry worth 125 tons for for the junta to stand. So the actual the survival of the Burmese state 
is actually due to Indian support. And of course, India has lost that pride of place over the decades in, in Myanmar. Today, I think the reading is not that different from the orthodoxy that has governed India's policy or perspective towards Myanmar since that point in time, since 1949. Uh, the, the policymakers are likely to see this as increased instability, and they would not pin the cause of instability to what was happened or what was done by the junta in February 2021. And this is where we qualitatively completely differ in how most observers view the situation there uh, and how the West views the situation there. They believe that the only source of stability or the part of the solution has to be Nepido and the, and the junta. And today what they might see moving looking forward is a breach between China and Nepido with all this offensive because this offensive has played out with Chinese support. So I will not be surprised that instead of diversifying its relationship in any meaningful way with all the different actors in that broken polity, India might actually in the next six months or uh, for one year actually double down on its support for, for the military regime. Oh. I would not be surprised. Fascinating. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question and then I'm going to open up the floor uh, to our audience, uh, again here in person as well as online for questions. Um, but the last one is just a follow up on this last point. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, convergence uh, maybe of worldview yeah. between a Hindu nationalist India yeah. and this current military junta. And I wonder uh, what you would what you would think about that, yeah. uh, and also um, if you can broaden out it just a little bit uh, about the implications mm. for its neighborhood, and if you'd like beyond for an India that has leaders that have this kind of worldview, yeah. which, at least on its face, looks different from what came before. There are sort yeah. of aspects of certainly of continuity, but also yeah. of change. I wonder how you think about that. No, that's actually, you know, this is arguably one of the least appreciated aspect of the, politi the politics that binds India and, and, and Myanmar, rather than just the, the policy elements of it, or the kind of, you know, the strategic elements of it. Uh, it is absolutely, when I was doing my research for the book, I was actually quite astonished to see that one of the, I mean, there has been a lot of anti-Indian uh, xenophobia in Burmese society, uh, Burmese politics, and we have seen that kind of take kind of very clear state uh, practices to push Indians out, especially in the 1950s, definitely in the 60s, and that kind of racial politics exists in, in Myanmar regardless of anything, but one outfit which has never been stopped from practicing is the Sanatan Dharam Swayam Sevik Sangh. Mm -hmm. And the individuals who lead that are actually, they were trained as pracharaks, as, as volunteers, as activists by the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh in India. Uh, and there is a very kind of underappreciated strain of ideological alignment here, where at least for the Hindu right and the Bamar Buddhist right, or that nationalist Sangha nationalism, uh, that look, Essentially, you're dealing all the separatism that you see, whether it's in India's northeast, whether it's in the minority ethnic areas of you know northern and eastern and western uh, Myanmar. They actually blame it less to the ethnic categorization of the communities that reside in those areas, more to the religious conversion that happened towards Christianity. They see that look, had Christianity not you know had Christian missionaries during during the colonial period. Uh, British, American, Canadian missionaries not converted these people to Christianity, they would have actually accepted their place as second, second rate citizens effectively in, in a federal, asymmetric federal union uh, as they see it, at least in the Myanmar, in Myanmar case. In India's case, it was less parochial. Uh, and that is where I feel that that, that, LM, that idea, it continues to shape the, the worldviews of both the Hindu right and, and the Obama. And a good case to actually focus this, you know, to really you know, lend focus to this particular alignment is the Rohingya crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, we have seen India kind of electorally kind of manipulate the issue of Rohingyas, whether it's in Jammu or Hyderabad or elsewhere. Delhi, there are communities who came long before the exodus began in 2017. Uh, they, they actually saw this primarily from a Muslim lens, 
and a separatist lens. So, so the Nepido's advocacy has been the Rohingyas are basically a community that is seeking separatism just like all other states and which for, for any Western observer or any observer of the country of its contemporary politics makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And you go back into the archives and it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. The Indians have actually historically from 1949 to 2023 broadly subscribed to the similar view of the Rohingyas or the Mujahid parties at, as it was known then uh, that look this was a separatist movement and it took its shape, it took, it took birth during the Second World War, the V Force, it was supported by the British. And, and uh, during partition, the, the Bhutidong Mongdo Belt in North Rakhine, the communities there literally went to Jinnah and said, look, we should be part of Pakistan because we are a Muslim dominated demography. And that idea has stuck even if it is not real and true in practice. Uh, so those are, I think that's something which needs to be teased out more. It needs to be studied more. And just a last caveat, uh, yes, there is a Hindu nationalist element to it. There's a, there's a religious element to it. Mm. Even a kind of liberal Nehruvian India, Nehru himself viewed uh, the spread of Christianity in these areas in not very different lens than what you would see the Hindu nationalists view it. He was not very pleased by the fact that a lot of missionaries were act, you know, quite active. So I would be also cautious not to put all the causality of this alignment only towards a particular worldview that seems to have dominant seems to dominate in India today. This was something that Indians shared even during Nehru and Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi's period, even if they didn't make much of it, at least in policy rhetoric and official discourse. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, okay, so as promised, I'm going to open the floor to your questions. Uh, please raise your hand, uh, and we have microphones uh, that will come to you. So I think I see one straight back. Yeah, right there. And if you could say your name and affiliation, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk, uh, Lucas Myers with the Wilson Center. Uh, so you know, in the recent weeks in Myanmar, we've seen the resistance offensives prove quite successful. Uh, particularly on the border with India in Sagaing and, and Chin State, and some of the border posts appear to have been taken in the open source. Um, and so I'm curious, would that change India's policy at all if you know, the border, for instance, is, falls out of the junta's control? I don't think it would change the basic fulcrum of India's policy, which is still supportive of the junta. I don't think that will happen. And a good comparative case would be what happened in, in Afghanistan in 2021. India supported the Islamic Republic to the last day before it actually tilted away and pivoted away and started reaching out to, to the Taliban. And that was a nine month period before India went back and opened its embassy. So unless the resistance is able to topple the junta, I don't foresee India shifting its policy preemptively given the shifts that we see on the battlefield. They still view this as a very fluid battlefield. They still view the junta offensive, despite its success, being strategically limited. They do not, I don't think New Delhi is putting its bet on a collapse of the junta in totality, maybe more so on the breakup of Myanmar. But then they see that this was a breakup that was more or less in effect uh, even before. Right. So, so, so yes, things have the fault lines have become sharper, but that does not that has not kind of completely imploded the polity. In terms of your point on Indo-Myanmar border, especially in the the uh, Rikado, uh, border in Mizoram, the, the Chin National Front has uh, taken up that border post in Mori and Tamu border crossing. The junta is still controlling the crossing, even if the PDF and other resistance kind of groups are very active in Tamu itself. Um, I do think that India has outreach and access uh, to these groups, but I don't think that India would do anything that would empower them in a strategic sense the way we see happening in terms of bearing support for the Three Brotherhood Alliance. Uh, at least not for now. I do think there is a debate on this. So, so I'm not saying that this is a settled question. Uh, this, this, there is a growing debate as the situation evolves in India, especially in the intelligence circles and the defense circles, but the policy circles who actually craft and articulate that policy, I don't think they would jump that, that uh, gun anytime soon. Great. Yep. Nalanthi from USIP. Uh, can you, uh, on Bangladesh, can you comment on India's ability to shape 
Sheikh Hasina with regard to the Western criticisms, U.S. criticisms of the elections. Uh, essentially, the, this current period, previous elections, are have you detected India trying to shape Sheikh Hasina in being responsive or giving the appearance of being responsive to some of these uh, concerns about how the, the conduct of elections uh, or do, do you not see that at all? Do you, do you see uh, the, the current administration being completely in aligned uh, alignment with Sheikh Hasina or how does that compare to the Congress party or uh, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. Look, I don't think there would have been much difference had a Congress government been in power in New Delhi and approaching Bangladesh today, as has been the case with the BJP. I don't think so, uh, because the, the structural realities of that relationship are such uh, that even Congress would have been anxious for about exactly the same issues that the BJP is. So I would not necessarily, in case of Bangladesh, I, would, I don't give ideology. I mean, of course, it's there, this whole uh, concern about Jamaat coming back into political play and kind of, you know, extracting a price in terms of targeting Hindu minorities, which is a big kind of lightning rod in terms of Indian domestic politics today. But those concerns would were, were there and would have continued to be there had a Congress government been in power in Delhi. In terms of shaping Sheikh Hasina's uh, approach or the response towards the pressure she's facing, look, she has been able to withstand a lot of Western pressure because she knows India has her back. That's very clear. She does know that even if India would push her into kind of, you know, editing stuff on the margins, as they say it, right? Uh, the fundamental uh, calculus is that whatever happens, we are with you, right? Uh, and that creates a very paradoxical sort of a, a, a kind of moment or kind of a, you know, circumstance that on one hand, India is telling its Western allies, it's telling United States that, yeah, we also want free and fair election. But the silent annexe here is that uh, the contours of free and fair will be limited structurally. And that is being done by the complete assault, uh, very kind of widespread assault on the opposition, especially the BNP, right? And that is something which India is quite OK with. They have, in fact, officially said that, you know, don't ascribe all these human rights violations and clamping down on the opposition to us. That is Bangladesh's domestic politics. We support the constitution. And by when they say that we support the constitution, that's basically actually backing Hasina's claim that the constitution does not allow a military, uh, any caretaker government, any caretaker government, right? So I do think that they want to shape it. They do want her to get out of this as kind of, you know, uh, uh, stain free, so to say, in a political sense as possible. But they're also very real about the limits of that. So this is where I would say the strategic fulcrum continues to lie. Um, I believe we have some questions from the audience uh, online. I want to get to those in a second, but I just, I just quickly wanted to follow up on this last point uh, with respect to um, India's position in Bangladesh. Uh, India has uh, sort of jealously kept the United States, or tried to keep the United States at arm's length in all of these countries, but has, I think, failed <laughs> in, in certain ways, uh, particularly in Pakistan, uh, now seems to have grave concerns about what the United States is saying and doing in mm -hmm. Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that, that balancing act, particularly as India and the US are coming closer together? See, there is, again, this is, th th that's, that's a contradiction of India's foreign policy in 21st century, where you are aligned with the United States, but you don't want to uh, be seen as being allied with the United States. And this speaks out most, I, I guess, in the neighborhood where India still continues to believe that this is you know, their neighborhood, this is our neighborhood. You know, we, determine the, the, we determine the bottom lines and everything rest is up for negotiations, both with ad adversaries like China and allies like the United States. Now, I have a different reading of India's kind of welcome of extra regional powers in this neighborhood. Yes, India did not welcome Western interfere or Western engagement, especially during Indira Gandhi's time, right? This sort of very securitized sense of uh, this is our neighborhood or Indian Monroe doctrine as, as this, they call it. But India even then coordinated policy and practice with the Soviet Union. Uh, 71 is a classic case in point. The Indo-Soviet friendship treaty did not cause, uh, in, in, it didn't have a direct impact on Indian decision making to wage war but it gave it a very critical strategic blanket, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the India has the element of playing your big power allies in the neighborhood 
on a selective country by country, moment by moment, issue by issue basis. That is how I see as, you know, this is how it's asserting its autonomy and power. And some would say, if you ask from a non-Indian perspective, hegemony mm. in the subcontinent. And Bangladesh is a very classic case in point. In, in Sri Lanka, we have seen amazing coordination between the United States and India. And India realized that it needed the United States in, 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 in Colombo. In Maldives, there is increasing alignment. Mm. Uh, but that's not the case with Bangladesh or for that matter, even Myanmar. So this, this selectiveness of India, we will tell you where we want your support, not you coming and tell us where you want democracy. Mm. That is basically, in a nutshell, India asserting itself in the neighborhood. Great, good point. Um, yes, go ahead. And thank you so much, Brigitte from USIP, with a couple questions from the audience, um, combining a few on Bangladesh that have identified a real decline in public opinion um, within Bangladesh on India. Um, to what extent does this factor into India's policy making? And does it pose any long-term risks for India? So yes, the, there is certainly a long-term risk if you have a neighboring country where a mass of public opinion does not view you favorably, right? It could uh, engender itself in the kind of uh, lack of support you get when you play Australia in the World Cup final. It could engender itself in uh, violence against minorities on Durga Puja, uh, Hindu minorities. It could engender itself in terms of life threat to Indian diplomats on the ground. It could engender itself in many different ways. And that is a risk that I think New Delhi is very alive to. Uh, but there is also a feature, if you look at the, this very aspect from Delhi's perspective, that when was the last time we were actually you know, quote unquote, loved by a mass body of opinion in our smaller, in, in countries in our neighborhood. Arguably never. So what, do you put that kind of analytical political weight behind that lack of popularity to shape your policy? I don't think New Delhi does that. Of course, it's, it does not want it. Of course, it does not want to be, it has worked a lot you know, its entire policy outreach, its outreach in terms of connectivity, giving more visas, people to people connectivity is meant to blunt that, that lack of popularity. But it is not something that would kind of really shift its fundamental calculus. And that's where it kind of, you know, does not privilege uh, democracy. Because participatory, uh, genuine electoral democracy, uh, from Indian perspective, means a lot of anti-India populism in these countries. Great. We have another question in the room. And Brigitte, do we have more online? Or Okay, we'll come back to those. So, uh, but go ahead. Yes, apologies for coming late. Uh, there was another meeting, but um, if you yesterday... If you can just say your name. Oh, for sorry. The, yeah. I'm Bina Nepram uh, right now, Senior Advisor at USIP here on Indigenous Issues. Um, yesterday, one of the Manipur's biggest armed groups, uh, one of its factions signed a peace agreement. And you mentioned about Tamu still standing strong when all the border towns mm. are being controlled right by the pro democracy forces and with the signing of this peace accord yesterday do you see new delhi having a direct line through manipur to supply napido with the materials that it need you know that's one thing the other thing is avinash you and i we have been researching this area for almost a decade and a half we are talking about 45 million in India's Northeast and 60 million in Myanmar, which has not seen peace for generations. Why do you think this region is in such a turmoil? Yeah. And what is the, you mentioned about that India may see the breaking up of Myanmar and not giving up on the junta yeah. and vice versa. What happened in Manipur in the last seven months we saw the creation of buffer zones. We know that several uh, parliamentarians from Myanmar are in Mizoram. Do you think that it may also do a similar impact? In fact, I had said that the balkanization of Manipur can lead to the balkanization of Northeast India and can hurt India's national security interests. Do you think New Delhi is acutely aware of this? And do you think they are doing any steps because for us from the region, this is a very real scenario and is New Delhi even aware that it's double 
talk and double doing can hurt its national mm. security interest. Forget about confronting China. So we are really worried about what's happening, not just in northeast of India, but across the, no the Indo-Burma border, which I call it, and in, in, in ways in which the history of 100 million people are not in the textbooks of Yangon or in Delhi. Mm. So there's 100 million people. We don't even know who they are. Mm. And how do we even attempt as, a, as, as nations, as concerned citizens and scholars to understand this region and bring about a peace that each of this region and its ethnicities deserve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bina, for that. Those really important and pressing questions. On the first issue of whether India having a line through Manipur to Nepito, uh, I don't have access to that information, so I don't know is my honest response. I just don't know. I would not be surprised. Uh, but I do think India has a very direct line to Nepito as well, and that is quite a quite a functional line as far as I know, right? In fact, India has strived to really make sure that its lines to Nepito don't get cut like they did between 1998 to 1992, 93. Right? That is something that you don't want history to repeat. It's a bit like Afghanistan. You want to talk to the Taliban because you don't want to be in a situation where you had no channel with the Talibs when they were in power between 1996 to 2001 and the Kandahar hijack happened. So, so that those lines do exist. In what shape, form is something that, of course, uh, is, is uh, up to detail and up to ex for exploration. On the issue of Manipur and the desire for peace and whether central government actually understands the dynamics, I have a two-part response on that, Bina. Look, in terms of actual political reconciliation, post May 2023, when this new kind of uh, uh, new chapter of kind of social political conflict has really emerged in in South Manipur, I think right now there is a realization that in New Delhi might not have the capacities or the equities on the ground, if not the intent or the political intent in New Delhi to actually resolve the inter-society kind of uh, splits that we have seen play out between the Zokuku commu communities and the Meiti communities. And that's why I think, uh, unfortunately so, but the likelihood of that buffer zone, which has been manned by India security forces, uh, running from Imphal to, I think, Chura Chandpur, that is likely to continue. That is not a long-term solution. I think everyone is aware of that. Uh, but that is, from India's perspective, it would abate actual kind of conflict and you know uh, prevent loss of life and loss of property at least so that is it's a it's a preventive defensive mechanism rather than a proactive resolution you know resolution uh, minded perspective on the point and that speaks to you know how the larger politics of the bjp has played out in the northeast i think Unlike the Congress, which of course played different communities, different factions within communities, it had a very counter-insurgency-centric approach to even electoral politics, right? Congress-led counter-insurgency campaigns were very deeply tied to Congress' desire to have electoral dominance in states of Asa, in Assam and elsewhere, right? Their alliances were formed accordingly. With the BJP, I think they have taken a call that you want to do a, a kind of ethnic or, or demographic arithmetic where the majorities are what they are. And that has a very powerful impact on who you ally with, how you deal with this current chief minister who's there in, in Manipur, how do you deal with the conflict. And partly that explains why even in, if you extend that logic of majoritarianism to Manipur, why India would actually continue to support the junta. Uh, and that also explains why UNLF, which is a Meiti group primarily, or a faction of UNLF, a powerful faction, uh, has agreed to enter a ceasefire, uh, it raises the question about what does this mean uh, in terms of ceasefire and accord, if not more than a ceasefire actually, uh, with the Kuki or Zo Kuki groups in South, and the the kind of you know uh, lion, the elephant in the room, the Naga Peace Accord, which has been kind of somewhere hanging in the middle for forever, effectively since 1997, definitely since 2014. Those questions remain, and I don't think anyone in New Delhi has a clear-cut answer to that. Uh, that is both because of their own politics, but also because of lack of knowledge, or lack of interest beyond a point in Northeast, because it's just not electorally as salient in India's national parliamentary landscape uh, as some other states like UPR, for example. And it's, that is an unfortunate reality. 
It militates against BJP's pitch that uh, Northeast is very central to us ideologically, right? That is the big pitch of the Hindu nationalists. This is part of the family. Uh, and we are seeing breakage there. Uh, so yeah, it's a deeply worrying situation. I don't foresee any immediate uh, resolution in the near term, unfortunately. Yeah. The balkanization question. The balkanization, look, I mean, uh, they have tried very hard to make sure that the kind of split that we have seen between the Kukis and the Metis do not uh, sort of spill over between the Nagas and the Metis or the Nagas and the Kukis or have kind of ripple effects in Assam. So they have gone on a lot of, you know, in Assam there has been a whole degree of a, a whole drive to sign accords with different groups. Even just yesterday, while they signed the accord with UNLF, it was even Ulfa I factions were coming and giving weapons, and there was a huge kind of celebration around that. So, so they are trying to prevent that, actually. Uh, whether they succeed or not is, of course, an open question. Uh, but that is, I would say, the basic policy right now to prevent, or to cut your losses, to prevent damage, uh, and to prevent balkanization, as you see it, of the other fault lines in Northeast, uh, and contain this to the geography that we have seen in South Manipur. Yeah. Uh, Brigida, do you have? And then another question from online. Um, how does China's growing influence in Myanmar impact how India navigates its own relationship with Myanmar and particularly kind of consider regional security dynamics? Thanks. So China is, you know, partly India has always accepted Chinese dominance in Myanmar. And it has always tried to kind of offset uh, some of that influence by reaching out to Junta, by reaching out to other groups. But it has always, it has also accepted the status quo. You don't have the capability or the expertise to be able to do that beyond a particular point and to, to you know, beyond a particular point, to beyond a particular kind of effect. And I think that is something that will continue to shape India's calculus. How do you make sure that uh, the China-Myanmar economic corridor or China's presence in Rakhine uh, in terms of the Chokpu port and the special economic zone, economic footprint, China's outreach or playing every, every kind of ethnic armed group both against each other and against the junta, having equities with everyone, it does not impact upon your own desire for some degree of stability in that country but also to be able to capitalize on that stability quotient to build your own connectivity. Uh, uh, through Myanmar, right? This whole idea of creating the a port in Saitway uh, and then connecting that Saitway port all the way through a road two or three hundred kilometers into Mizoram, that is something which is not going to happen given the security dynamics. Um, and that is something that India is really kind of trying to figure out that whether it can shape the, the politics or the, or the realities, at least in the Indo-Myanmar border areas, uh, to at least achieve some degree of connectivity, to be able to build a road. And I think that is something that it will continue to struggle, uh, given you know, the situation on the ground. And even if you take China out of that equation, it is likely to struggle regardless of that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, OK, we have one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, I'm Shreyas. Uh, I'm a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you, Avinash. Uh, I have a question on India-Pakistan ties. You touched on this. Um, in the past, there have been attempts by the civilian leadership to establish dialogue, which has been undercut by the military. In 2021, the case was opposite. Is it fair to assume that there is no significant dialogue possible between India and Pakistan till the military and the civilian leadership are sort of in comport on what the policy should be towards India? Yes, basically, that's a short answer to that. But I think so the, the bigger concern in India right now, as far as Pakistan goes, and I addressed this in the, in the start of the conversation, uh, is not necessarily not exploring an opening after the elections if it does offer itself. Uh, but to how far you take it, in which direction you take it, and if it's, especially if it's Nawaz Sharif as a civilian head of state, uh, then things become easier. It's easier to have a conversation, if not substantially so. Uh, the biggest question mark in India's mind today is General Munir. I think what we saw post Galwan and the fact that General Bajwa did not exploit it in a military sense, it did earn him, earn him considerable degree of respect and a bit of trust in India's top most political leadership and top you know, power corridors. And I think that is something that Munir is yet to replicate. That trust quotient, and that does not mean that India does not necessarily uh, actively mistrusts him. They just don't know which direction. And I'll give you an example why that doubt has kind of per 
persisted in some sense. Uh, if you look at the situation inside Kashmir Shrias, right, uh, apart from the abrogation of Article 370, creation of union territories, India's struggle with holding elections again, uh, or bringing in, ushering in participatory politics in the new kind of realities, there has been an attack and another attack and again almost on a weekly or bi-weekly or a fortnightly basis and we have seen that translate into casualties of Indian soldiers in different shapes and forms. Uh, some of the attacks have been much more persistent, much more concentrated, they lasted days and you not you cannot have an attack that lasts for days in such a securitized setup when you're dealing with one of the most powerful counterinsurgency forces in the region uh, without some degree of support or logistical support uh, from professionals from other side of the border. And that is an assumption on which the Indian Armed Forces operate in Kashmir, but that has political ramification. Is this continuity or continuing to keep the pot boiling even if at a low heat in Kashmir, given the situation there, uh, is that policy? Uh, if it is policy, does it, you know, that means you're looking at a very different kind of a Munir, who once he gets out of his kind of domestic problems, will have a very different approach towards India, even if he wants to talk. Or is it not policy, and these are spoiler attacks being done by free agents, so to say, whether they're, you know, different Lashkars and the Harkats and all the Jayashi Mohammeds of the world, or Hezbollah. Uh, and if that is the case, then you have a different kind of a problem that can Muni deliver even if he wants to talk. And that is an open question in Indian mind, which, which side India's assessment uh, kind of tilts on this question in the next six months, six to 12 months, will play a very important role in how far at least New Delhi goes in terms of taking that conversation. On that note, I'm afraid we've run run our time here. Uh, Avinash, let me thank you uh, for sort of a thoughtful, as I said, tour of the region. Uh, that one that is both uh, historically informed and then very much up to date, uh, up to the minute almost, uh, in terms of developments in the region. Um, it's been fantastic to have you here. I'm glad you could spare some time to come across uh, from the UK uh, to join us here at USIP and to join our audience. If you could join me in thanking uh, Dr. Paliwal, uh, I think that would be a great way to close. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. And thank you to all of you.